Welcome to another edition of Round Talk with George. Some of you will recognize this building because I've done some stories through this. This is all part of the historical society here at downtown East. Harry Stansbury. Henry Stansbury, excuse me. It's alright. I'm old. Just ending with. And a lot of what you see here comes from you. I'm a collector of a lot of these cans of mine. How long have you been doing this? Uh, I've been collecting probably this kind of memorabilia for about 30 years, 35 years. And you live in? I have a house in Baltimore and a house here in Houston. Run back and forth. Yeah. Fun. 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 Uh, Yeah, that's where we that's where we live. That's where we're married life. Okay, and we have Al Smith. And welcome to the show. Thank you. And he has you explain exactly what you've got here. Well I was I'm past president of the society and uh, had the idea along with Larry uh, several months ago to Rekindled the interest uh, in, in canning in Talbot County, which was a major uh, uh, employer and, and, and was one, one of the, if not the leading business for 70 or 100 years. Uh, and I was here in the early, uh, I say in the late 50s, as a can salesman for Continental Can Company when the industry was still thriving. Cans up here from that time? Uh, they're, most of them are earlier than that. Earlier than that. Okay, we're going to be getting into all these cans. Now, someone you're all familiar with. Well, I'm Larry Denton. I'm the current president of the Talbot Historical Society. And we became interested in canning uh, and packing this exhibit uh, because, as Al just said, uh, canning. Uh, was a major industry here in Talbot County from about 1870 to 1970. And uh, during the uh, uh, post-World War II period, uh, uh, Maryland and Talbot County uh, were uh, just huge in the pack, uh, packing of tomatoes uh, and seafood too and oysters. Uh, uh, in 1951, Maryland uh, the eastern shore canned more tomatoes than California, uh, and that was 164 million cans of tomatoes came out of the eastern shore of Maryland. So we're uh, very, very attracted uh, to this uh, exhibit. Okay. Well, Larry, that, that's how you got there. Uh, canning today is, is a lot different. Well, uh, Al and, and Henry. It's a lot, a lot. It's the same, but it's, it's, it's on a much larger scale. And most of it is concentrated in California. Uh, there are probably as many cans used for fruits, vegetables, and, and, uh, and the like as there were in uh, the 1950s, but it hasn't grown much uh, volume wise. Uh, the can business has expanded in other areas, beer and soft drink and aerosols, etc. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the operation is much the same. Much the same. Okay. Is it, but most of it's in California. Most of the uh, uh, yeah, the vegetable and fruit can is in California. Is that because the vegetables are all grown there? And not it's, here, it's, well, it's because of several reasons. I mean, uh, the, uh, everything needs to be mechanized. Uh, there's mechanical picking of most of the, uh, of, of the product, especially tomatoes. And, uh, and there's less, less hand work uh, uh, done in, in, in today's product. And, uh, you know, it, there, there's the, there are the vagaries of the weather uh, out there. It's all, all the same and everything is irrigated. 
and uh, it, it's really just a matter of, of, uh, of scale and, and, uh, and the, uh, efficiency in doing it up, the operation, which was more difficult here. You had small farms, you had small calories. This is going back into the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s. And you canned oysters during the oyster season, the letters with the months with the R. Now, what do you do with this canning business in the summertime? You do fruits and vegetables. You can tomatoes. What you you tomatoes, do. mostly around here, but fruits and vegetables traditionally were, were what were canned. If you look at these cans, you can see there are a lot of fruits and a lot of vegetables, more vegetables than fruits. But that kept the canning business going year-round, and literally hundreds of thousands of people were involved in this business right. in the state of Maryland and Talpa County, which is, this historical society is all about, was representative of that of that tradition of oysters, and in the summertime canning tomatoes or other other vegetables, and that 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 whole industry just grew and grew until it was dominant in the state of Maryland. Actually, Baltimore was uh, was one of the uh, the, the main uh, focuses on the, on the canning business was in Baltimore, largely due to the Chesapeake Bay and the fruits of the bay but also the farms, and, and the farms were on the eastern shore, so the, the, the bay was the highway of transporting these goods. And of course, Talbot County, with all of its rivers and tributaries, uh, the, uh, the water served to, uh, as, as most of the canneries were right on, in a dock somewhere. And uh, so water transportation was tremendously Railroads important. involved. And then railroads came in. Railroads, the railroad came to Oxford, for example, uh, uh, and, and, and then Oxford, I guess at one point there were probably 10 uh, uh, canneries in Oxford. When I was here in the 50s, there were still three, uh, and uh, the railroad had ceased by that point. But the railroad uh, helped a lot, yeah. Even though they talk about Baltimore oysters as an example, you see a lot of cans around here say Baltimore oysters. Well, obviously they didn't come from Baltimore. <laughs> they were shipped to Baltimore, and that's where the canneries were set up. Then eventually, through Continental Can and other can manufacturers, they were able to do these great graphics on cans and sell, sell them to the local guys, and cut out the middleman, and they start packing their own. So that here in, in Talbot County, you have packing houses that have maybe 100 or 200 people involved that were shucking and, and no. packing in cans provided from Baltimore right. Right. <laughs> through Continental Can or other canning companies. It, some of the stories I've done in the past years um, came to my attention one of these. Uh, kids left school for a week, two weeks, or whatever to, to harvest the crops. Well, in the, in the summertime, I mean, there was hardly a kid around here, high school kid or certainly college kids when they came home, that didn't work in a cannery. I mean, it was the summer job. But I'm actually leaving classes on the school shut down. It could be, yeah. Well, I can remember picking corn when I was eight, nine, ten years old myself. The truck yeah. used to come and back up, and we'd all pile in the back of the truck and we'd go pick corn because we threw more husk than we could pick up. <laughs> <laughs> some great battles. But I mean, that's how old I am, is that there were a lot of people that, that kids and teenagers who went pit crops for the canning right. business. Schools closed a lot. Well, there was a tremendous sense of employment. For example, Harrison and Jarvo, which was at five factories in Tulsa County, uh, across Walmart had a huge cannery. And at one time, they were the largest single cannery fancy hand-packed hand peeled tomatoes. They had 400 women over there peeling tomatoes. And, uh, and did, uh, largely uh, supplied, they were, they were very uh, prominent in supplying uh, the Defense Department during the war, both wars actually. George has had a, a, an enormous uh, impact on the development of culture and society here because uh, in the late, uh, 1800s, you know, the nation's coming out of the Victorian period. In the Victorian period, you know, women were, were supposed to stay in the house, 
uh, would harm them to be educated, yada, yada, yada. And here is an industry that gets women out of the house, A, and B, more importantly, gives women paychecks. Uh, so it had, uh, it had really an enormous implication for the development of a, of a culture here mm -hmm. on the art. I saw trap. I saw a lot of the uh, coins they handed out for right. packing these things up. Right. Right. Uh, we have a we have a collection. collection of them here. I've got a fellow named Joe Seacrest, who loved them, the rest of us, this collection of us do, is a collector of canning memorabilia. And he has the largest collection of tokens. That's what's Tokens, right? And the tokens were handed when, when you finished peeling and you had a bucket of tomatoes ready to move into the production line. Uh, you were given a token to, to say that you had done that piecework. And uh, actually, right. actually, they had the other, there's the other tail back there. It's, 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 yeah. You said that the tokens and the oyster trade would have been for a gallon when a uh, shucker right. had shucked a gallon of oysters, uh, they would take the gallon up, and in exchange they would get a token. And the token would rep represent our number of cents per gallon they got paid. End of the day, you trade in your tokens for money. And uh, so the tokens are very interesting, and people collect, some people just collect nothing but tokens. tokens right. I've seen <laughs> that at the, uh, some of them I went to, gentlemen, several of them, all they put up on the boards were tokens. Right. We have a terrific, if anybody wants to come and look at this exhibit, one of the things they want to look at is the notebook full of page after page of tokens. And they're all, all, all from in this general area. And a lot of them have identification of the, the cannery that they, they do. Yeah, they have, they have, and there are also people that collect the cans primes because of the graphics. The graphics that the uh, that, that were developed by some very specialty, very good specialty printers in Baltimore right. are uh, have resulted in collectors who collect cans the same way Joe collects those uh, well the coins. The maritime museum does it expensive. Yeah, it does. It does. It does. It does. Uh, oyster tins, cans. Uh, they they were they were up to a point where they were labeled, but of course labeled due to paper labels, and that's another source of collection. This is another thing that this Joseph this collects. And actually, we do have some labels next door for sale in the uh, in farm antiques that uh, courtesy of Joe. Uh, but, uh, but decorating right on the can uh, was became more prominent in the early 1900s actually was developed in England in 1870, but really took hold here uh, in the 20s. But these, yeah, they're popular. A lot of them are, are, are very attractive and rare. Some are rare. And yeah, they can sell for, uh, in some cases, uh, well over $1,000. Yeah, really. Because I can. So, I mean, you're looking, you're looking at, at a, a valuable collection of them. Of right. Our, uh, Joe's and, and also one in mine. The, the square can that has up there, I've never seen one of those. That's extreme. This is a handmade can there. This, this is uh, the James E. Stansberry. That's how one of the ways I got started. I had somebody in my heritage who was in the canning business, a uh, hand soldered can, and uh, for the James E. Stansberry Pioneer brand. That's also embossed. Yeah. Uh, oyster Company. And how long did it take to make that? Uh, I really don't know. What would you guess, Jim? I don't know. Several minutes. I mean, uh, they got you, good they, they, sure. they, you have to cut the pieces out, and you have to enter, you bent them over something. Oh, you see the bends, right? And uh, and then and then you, uh, you, you the solder is all done by hand. This is where the can companies came into into being in the early 1900s. They developed the equipment to automatically make cans. Because they'd have to sit there and make cans all winter to use them all summer or, or vice versa. And the advertisement for James E. Stansbury uh, would, would indicate that they made, made cans for both oysters and also for fruit and vegetables. And they also saved the shells for 
for uh, uh, fill for roads, I had for fertilizer, and for uh, uh, lying. Well, well, Tilden Factory Company in Tilden was built on an oyster shell island. Pear Street in Oxford is an oyster shell. There's pictures of that, right? Yeah. And, and the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum is on oyster, oyster shells. Shell. Right. 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 I'm just wondering how long would it take to bend the transfer? Well, you'd have several, there'd be several stages usually. <clears throat> Somebody would be given the job of cutting it, some bending it, and then some soldering it. So there'd be sort of a mini assembly line. Wow. But, uh, but, well, but, that, but this is very rare. Most of them are round. So there's only right. one seam on the side. It's quite, a, quite an interesting That is quite <laughs> <laughs> Just curiosity, what's that worth? You know, I was very lucky. I found this on eBay, believe it or not, about 15 years ago, where people were really going crazy on oyster tins, and I paid only $150 for it. But I think it would be worth a whole lot more now. You get $1,000 or $2,000 for it. Yeah. I'm a collector. Amazing. Because it's so rare. Yeah. yeah. I collect. I know it's so <clears throat> Wow. You ever heard of it? around no, this is the only one I've ever found. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen any more around here. It's just amazing. But the but the, the collecting side of it is uh, rarity, location, graphics, condition, right. like collecting anything else. Right. And, and condition is very important. Condition is very important. And uh, there are people. There are literally hundreds of uh, collectors of oyster tins and and paper tins. Many of them will be uh, set up during the Waterfowl Festival. You, if you went to the community center, uh, in the parking lot, they have a buy-sell swap, and there's oyster tins all over the place. Mm -hmm. And as Al pointed out, there's a really good collection on display at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime yeah. 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 Museum. And normally, people who collect these also collect boat bottles, like the, uh, yeah. You know, the oyster and boat models, and then they'll collect the advertising art, which we have on the walls here. There's a lot of history that goes along with this. Are, are the, the battles people. still going on now? I see that every once in a while you're reading the paper. So are you? <laughs> yeah, there's still people yeah. raiding the uh, oyster bars that, yeah. should, that shouldn't be doing it. That's right. But that's, that's the problem yeah. with, with the, the, the farm culture. People go in and raid it at night. Yeah. It's, uh, but we're hoping that the oyster trade will come back. We'll have more and more Ch Chesapeake uh, Bay oysters uh, as a result of the aquaculture industry that's oh, right, oh, taking sure. place now. Go into that process again. How? You, all right. Well, canning or, or the, the uh, uh, pr preservation of food in sealed containers really dates back to the Napoleonic era, and uh, and Napoleon put gave a prize or offered a prize to someone who could figure out a way to preserve food better so that the army could be supplied. And a chef by the name of Nicholas Appere came along and developed a heat process whereby you put the product in a package, in that case it was glass, and, and sealed it and then heated it, thereby sterilizing it and giving it a shelf life. Cans didn't come along until about, say, 10 years later. And, and in those days, they were, per, they were called canisters, and therefore the word can came from that, where sterilization then be, began in cans. What you're driving at, and we're, we're, what we're call, I call this a canning and packing exhibit, I, and I'm referring to canning as actually sterilization in the cans, but packing, on the other hand, is, is packing a product in a can, especially oysters and, and, and crab meat and keeping it re refrigerated as opposed to processing it. Therefore, again, you keep it fresh for, uh, I guess, weeks or maybe the maximum of a month. Whereas the uh, canning operation, uh, once you sterilize it, it can be kept indefinitely. Uh, they, the, the processing, first of all, they processed in boiling water. It would take about six hours to, to sterilize a package. Uh, then they developed a, uh, uh, they decided that if they put salt in the water, it would raise the temperature, the boiling temperature of the water from 212 up to about 240, and therefore you could take what had been a six hour uh, uh, processing time and reduce it to 60 minutes. 
uh, layer of pressurized cooking came along. We're all familiar with pressure cooking. And with pressure cooking, you could run the temperature up and you could, you could uh, 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 sterilize the, the product in the can much, much quicker. And, and then there were continuous cookers and you could do it continuously. So the process has really uh, uh, developed over the years and sped up, mechanized. Mm -hmm. And it's still used today. And it's still used today. Now, what we're talking about here is what went on here in Easton and the Eastern Shore and all the processing that went on. Uh, is a large industry from what you, we've discussed. And it employed women, men, right. kids, young men, and it just kept going. Right. Well, it lasted. It started, the first cannery in Easton was on Easton Point, and that was in 1870. I think the name was Munson. Munson, and uh, and and it you know it developed from there. And that was when they they we were canning oysters and then subsequently tomatoes at Easton Point. Uh, and again, water transportation had an awful lot to do with with the development of the business and availability of farmland. Also, the availability of wood which was used to uh, uh, create the boilers to create the heat to do the processing in the early, in the early days. But well, one of the things that, that I wanted to do when, when we uh, decided that, to have this, this seminar, which we had last, last Saturday, was get some people who I knew who were intimately involved with canning here in Tulsa County. And uh, notably, uh, the Wrightson factory was uh, was, was extremely large and, and took uh, uh, most of the what's sectioned out by uh, uh, the, the bypass uh, uh, and being right on the rail line. And the Wrightson cannery started in the, in the 1890s and, and lasted until probably 1960. And Skip Wrightson, uh, who many of you know, uh, was uh, uh, a young man at the, at the time, as, as the cannery closed down, he could tell you the history of that. But he worked in the cannery as a kid, and they were a major packer of peas and corn and beans, and, and were an early developer in the product cream style corn, right here in Tulsa County. Uh, another is Leo Nolmeyer, whose dad ran Oxford Packing Company. There's a picture of that. That's now, that's now, where, that's now, uh, See, that's now a schooner's landing oyster for this. And uh, they were a major packer of oysters in Crabby. And Leo was, uh, I worked as a kid in, in his father's factory. And the third was a fellow named Charlie Adams, who was in Trap. And uh, uh, his company was Defender Packing Company, subsequently Charwell Canning Company. And that was the last cannery to close down in Tulsa County, and that was the you know, about 1998 or 9, I think it was, they finally closed down. But the, the Adams family uh, in two branches uh, uh, were, were really pioneers in, in the tomato packing business, and they were located in the trap. And Charlie was here to, uh, uh, to, to make a presentation, too. So we had, we had some real live participants who, were, yeah. who had been involved. Yeah. We had a standing room only crowd. Uh, it was uh, extremely well received, uh, and each one of these uh, uh, now uh, older gentlemen uh, participated as a, a growing up child uh, in the family canning business. So it was very, very special to have them here. Well, then Al was the interlocutor. I mean, he ran the show because I had I had to pull them like this when they were right there too long. <laughs> <laughs> he ran the show. And, and, he knew it from the canning side, you know, from right. the supply the can making side. Can making side. And because he called on so many different companies, he had the overview that was yeah. necessary to pull it off, and he did a great job. The uh, Condell Can Company came to the Eastern Shore uh, in the 1930s when they bought uh, called the Eastern Shore Can Company, which was in Herlock. And uh, I actually had my office uh, in Herlock. Today, it's the our office building is the Herlock Police Station, <laughs> but uh, uh, but I think it's noteworthy to also mention what happened in, what went on in Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge had uh, Phillips Packing Company. Cambridge was a company town 
employ 10,000 people uh, at the peak, at the peak of, uh, of the season. And Phillips Packing Company in Cambridge was a major packer of just about everything. Uh, Phillips was the largest canner, uh, independent canner of soup in the world. Uh, after Campbell and Heights, Phillips Packing Company right in Cambridge packed everyone's private label soup, the AMPs and the Yankees and so forth, had their own brands of soup, and it was packed right in Cambridge. Wow. So oh, that's gone now. That's the last one. So we're talking about a huge industry in this area. This huge. And it's disappeared. Yeah. It's, yeah. Pretty much gone. Except for we have all the memory. Right. And, people and we have us that are left. Yeah, a couple old people <laughs> around them. Remember. So Larry, how long is this thing going to be open? This, <clears throat> this uh, exhibit will uh, be open every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. until Saturday, December 17th. Uh, come by and see it. You will not be disappointed. Uh, this is uh, an industry uh, that impacted Talbot County in a very fundamental way. But Larry, is it going to also be open at additional times during the waterfowl? At the, during the waterfowl, thank you. During yeah. the uh, waterfowl festival, it will be open Friday, Saturday, That's and right. Sunday, yeah. uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, also, we will have on display here the uh, bronze of Dr. Harry Walsh, the uh, founder of the Waterfowl Festival. So uh, we'll be ready. You know, I don't this, think any, any should, we, we shouldn't bypass the, the, the one night of my, I forgot, I forgot to mention, and that's Tillman Packing Company. Uh, Tillman Packing Company was the town of Tillman. Uh, they, they, uh, they packed seafood in the, in, the, in the wintertime. They started out the season canning Harry and Harry Rowe, and Harry, Harry has virtually disappeared from the bay. And uh, then they had a second cannery on shore where they canned fruits and vegetables. And they were the largest employer in Tilden and, and very prominent in the development of a lot of, they also froze, and uh, they were the first packer, uh, to my knowledge, of fish sticks for the A&P company. Oh. Uh, and that was done right in Tilden. So there's, there's a lot of a lot of history connected a lot of with Talbot County. If, if people wanted to know more, or our audience wants to know more about it, come here and get it. But then there's other places around. There are a couple of reference books uh, that, that we have over there. That there's a, that's a book about just canning on the canneries on the eastern shore. That's a smaller of the two. And then there's there's one on Packing and, and uh, saving our harvest, it's called. And uh, this is a, a, a broader, uh, uh, but, but basically we're concentrating what happened on the mid Atlantic, in the mid, the mid Atlantic states. But this is called Canneries on the Eastern Shore. This was published in about 1985, and this was published, um, I think, 2002, something like that. And they'll be on display, and you can look at them here. They are available, uh, but uh, probably. Are on the oyster side, there is a, uh, a new publication put out by the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. Their education director named Kate Libby just published a new book that came out in, in 2015. And of course they have the oyster story uh, in a separate building and a very good display with lots of cans and a, an actual skipjack under the roof and some good audio talking about oystering on the bay. But the full canning story is best told here in this, in this exhibit, right. all the vegetables and all the, right. all the variety of things that were canned, as opposed to just the oyster story down at the Chesapeake Bay. We have reproduced a few copies of, uh, of a book about uh, a pamphlet uh, that was published by the SO Oil Company in, I think, the, right after the war in the 40s. And, and which really aptly describes what went on in Tillman Island, what the Tillman Pack and the history of Canada. So a lot of it, did, did a lot of this go to the troops World War II? A lot of it, oh yeah, absolutely. That's where, where it mostly went. Uh, the, the industry here really ramped up during the Second World War. And it, go, it goes back, as, as I said, not only to the, to, 
which goes back to the Napoleonic Wars, but also our Civil War uh, uh, back in the mid uh, mid 1800s. Uh, they, they were, uh, that was a surge in the canning business to support, especially Union troops. Um, also, you know, there, there was a, a, quite a bit of activity with uh, coming into uh, Baltimore on, on ships that went around the, uh, uh, the Cape Horn in order to where uh, the gold rush occurred. And those ships needed to be outfitted, and Baltimore was the place to do that with canned goods that were available. And so there were, there were little spurts that, that, uh, that pushed them along in the canning business. Uh, in terms of was business. a major player in this whole canning. was the major player. The right. major the player. The major right. player. And the White War was yeah. the major hub. It was the hub in there, and the rail lines out of Baltimore supplied cans to the Midwest. And the, a lot of the advertisements that you see in the Midwest talk about Baltimore produce, Baltimore oysters, in Detroit, Chicago, you know, in the Midwest. Railroad, so, rail line, like rail was it? Rail was it? Yeah, absolutely. And to some extent, New Jersey, and of course Delaware, the Midwest, and the northern neck of Virginia. And all the Baltimore stuff. A lot of the Baltimore stuff came from the Eastern Shore by, you know, by Buckeyes, yeah, by right. boats and skipjacks were lined up in the harbor every day. Bringing produce over right. to be canned and bringing oysters over to be canned. So, but, but then, but then the, the, the idea that maybe we could can closer to the source of some of these raw products and the, the industry developed here. Well, I was leading to is that when you look at the history of Maryland, this is an important part yeah, of that history. Sure. It's the it's part of the fabric. Yeah. Yeah. This is really I, guess, it's, I didn't know is that deep. This is really, I could go on and on. Well, there, there, were, there were scores, 20, 30, 40 canneries right in, in Baltimore, right in the Inner Harbor. And, and, and they said in the summertime the, the water was red from the tomato right. uh, residue. Huh. Huh. It's fascinating. fascinating. That's another area that, that really began to hurt, and that was, uh, you know, sanitation. And then what do you, what do, you do with the... Uh, the, uh, the refuse from a, from a canning operation right. that became a serious issue. What did they do? But they eventually closed down. Yeah. They had, a, had some serious problems because everything went in the bay. So the same kind of industry, the same kind of problem the chicken industry is having today with, right. uh, with their waste. But, they, but here they just couldn't survive. You couldn't, do, you couldn't do some of this stuff today. It is fascinating. Very. Larry. Well, once again, this exhibit will be open every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. until Saturday, December 17th. A waterfowl festival we will be open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, you should come take a look at this, especially if you're from Tallahassee.